you've heard a lot about Samhsa next, so I will leave it there for now. Um, we want to bring forward a panel with a bit of a different perspective from what I typically understand is happening in these meetups. So the idea is to give an overview of how investors think through financing and investing. Um, as you might hear by my American accent, I'm originally from New York, and what I've learned in the past four years here is that the technical innovation side, in Israel we have down, um, and so we want to bring the conversation further on the financing and investing side. And so as a starting point, I think it'd be great to go investor by investor, have everybody briefly introduce themselves, their funds, and then we will take it from there. So, Roy, you want to start? So, hi everyone, nice to meet you all. My name is Roy Katzenelson. I'm with Lul Ventures. Lul is an early stage fund based here in Tel Aviv. Uh, we focus on pre and pre -seed, uh, seed and pre-seed companies. Um, typically, we're pretty sector agnostic, so we've done anything from semiconductors to healthcare to robotics as well. Uh, my perspective is a bit more on the generalist investor and how we see and how we assess uh, hardware companies, robotics companies. And it's always a bit different than the typical SaaS companies. Um, obviously costs are different, the way you get to revenue, the way you look at unit economics and gross margins are so different. Uh, and yeah, hopefully I can bring a bit of that perspective into the discussion. Thank you, so I'm Amir Weitman from Champet Capital. Uh, we are a local fund, we invest in Series A. In robotics, we have invested in Indoor Robotics, a company which we really love. Um, <clears throat> one thing, at the end of the day, yeah, we, we do diff we invest in Series A, as I said, but I, won't, I wouldn't say we are sector agnostics, because there are a few verticals, including robotics, which we like. But yeah, we have a wide range of uh, potential uh, uh, industries where we would be willing to invest. And, you know, it's very trivial what I'm going to say, but it's true. People need to remember that. You guys are competing for our money, not only against the other companies in the robotics field, but pretty much against the rest of the world. So you have to be able to be competitive on that level, which is not easy. And therefore, just to say <coughs> exactly the same as, as Leo, right? Roy, sorry. As what Roy, Roy said, and it's true, all these, all these metrics need to be at least as good, if not better, than you can see in other industries, and probably better because you know, if we're looking at enterprise software, uh, or SaaS only companies, um, there's no friction, there's not the ha there, there isn't the hardware friction. And here you're often is going to, you're going to have to face hardware friction, this is going to make things harder, and you need to justify that. So think about it, I think it's an important point. Hi, um, so many familiar places, uh, people here, uh, faces. Um, glad to be here, Evan Wagner, uh, I3, we're a super early stage deep tech fund here in Israel. We invest just like Clone, Pre-Seed and Seed uh, Ventures. Um, we do hardware, software. Personally, I am a, a little bit bored of uh, enterprise software, so robotics and anything hardware is my preference for us few years um, and also what I always say is that uh, hardware people are much more fun to work with than software people are less arrogant and uh, more hardworking so uh, glad to be here and hope to find the, the next uh, robotic investment here in this community cool thanks so if I'm understanding correctly uh, what you're saying is that there's a large opportunity cost if you're evaluating software companies versus hardware companies, and, and so B2B SaaS has been used as an example against robotics. And so one of the things that I'd like to hear more about um, is what are a few of the main questions and a few of the first questions you ask yourselves when you start evaluating a robotics company? So I'll start. Um, the first question I ask is, what's the cost of alternatives? So most of the tasks, most of the things that robotics companies are trying to change are being done manually today, be it by cheap labor, be it by 
a uh, skilled employee that does the, uh, the manual task, sometimes it's a repeated manual task, and it has a price point. And that's where the whole operation starts from. So if you're trying to replace an unskilled, uh, unskilled labor that gets paid minimum wage, which is, let's say, in the range of $1,000 a month, your price point has to meet that criteria. Typically, in order for someone to even consider switching those unskilled workers with your solution, with the hardware piece. And then on top of that, we talk about all the different financing options that you can finance this with. Often, and from the brief conversations I've had with people here today, you hear price points of um, manufacturing costs of t ranging from twenty to $150,000 per single unit. And funding this with equity financing is hard. It's hard for the investors, it's hard for the company, and there are a lot of different uh, models and different financing sources that we can use to leverage and really get the most out of these companies. And then the question I ask myself is, are these even relevant for a company, for this opportunity specifically? Can they get uh, AR lending, basically get, getting an advance payment on their accounts receivables? Can they get to asset-based lending? Can they find someone to really finance the hardware piece that they're developing, which changes the whole dynamic, the whole picture of what the actual opportunity is and what the actual cost is around? So these are the typical two main questions I ask when I see a hardware company. Um, for us, um, the first question I usually ask is your technology innovation. Okay. Um, so really, we're trying to understand is what is the hard problem you are solving and how do you solve it? Okay. You, of course, we can debate about what's the definition of a hard problem. It has to be, because the answer to that question will basically gives you your technology mode against the big guys or the other startups. Okay, that's the first thing. Then the other thing we're trying to assess is really the market, the size of the market. Okay. Because at the end we say, okay, if you can achieve, you know, reach 10% of the market, is that big enough? Many of the robotics company end up to be too much a niche, a vertical. Okay. That's sort of lessons learned. That's why we encourage the builders in this era to leverage you know, the technologies, the new wave of technologies, try to broaden your market. Okay. The past you know, decades of a robotic company all special you know, purpose box. That's tough. So then you end up, whether you like it or not, you become part of a a component of a solution, a big solution, and you have very little pricing power. Okay. Try to be more general purpose. Okay. Yeah, I think so. You guys said, I guess, most of the relevant points I would add that uh, we as a fund like to invest in deep tech. And um, yeah, we like to see that there's a clear technological advantage. That whatever the startup is doing is not going to be become, I would say, a commodity in short order, right? So that's true everywhere, that's true also for robotics. <clears throat> I would tell you, you know, without saying names, but I've seen companies where essentially the same sort of solutions popped up with four, five, six companies just in Israel at very early stages. So you ask yourself, okay, but just in Israel, I'm sure in the rest of the world there's gonna be probably a couple of dozen more. So in what way do we have the ability to actually differentiate between the winner and the winners most of them which, has, which are going to be losers. If at all there's going to be a winner, which is not that clear, because what you said is completely true. And, um, if I don't feel that I have the ability to understand why I'm going to invest in A and not in B, then it's a pass automatically. I have to have a very, very clear differentiator, I would say. Um, something that's easy to grasp on the financial, on the economic model, and on the te technological side. And I have to understand why this technology is not going to become a commodity two years from now. It's interesting, in a nutshell. 
you know why I sat here and not here? Because I have nothing to add. I'm the last one in line here, and I don't want to waste time. I'm eager to Careful, hear the we'll next start with question. Next time. No, no, no. We're please go back keep around. the same order. If I have something really unique to add, I will be not be shy. <laughs> He's right. Uh, I had to think about trying. You know, what can I add after these two guys? These two guys. All right. Now we got it. You, you, you set this up for a lamp. We got to start the other end. <laughs> so. What, what we've discussed so far is a lot about the tech innovation and how that, and, and we look for the tech mode, and I think one of the common things both internally in our own investment committee and, and from conversations with, conversations with other investors that we discuss is how do you balance the tech innovation with the commercial applicability and the, and, and the, the core metrics, which is back to your unit economics, the revenue streams, and, and one of the things we've noticed so far is that tech innovation is far ahead of where multinationals, corporates, et cetera, typically are. And so, starting with the other end, um, how do you think through balancing tech innovation and commercial traction? I think, at least from my experience with hardware companies, sometimes the, the idea for the tech innovation, the, the core science, if we can call it that, uh, is really mature in the founders' heads, but not really ready for meeting customer demand. And at least when we invest, um, it's really important to, for us that before you start developing the product, fully understand the need that the customer has. And sometimes when you think about the customer, it's actually a hundred different use cases for a hundred different customers, and then you're never going to get the product right because you're not focused on actual customer needs. <coughs> Once you have that, you can really develop a product that responds correctly to customer needs, and including the environment, including the people, including all the different factors that actually come to play when you introduce the, the product to the customer. Investors typically, that's what I keep saying, trust you that you can develop the product. The, the best example is ex Elizabeth Holmes, which is now in jail, uh, because you know she was able to sell the, the idea and never deliver on the product while lying the whole, you know, the whole time. At the end of the day, developing the product based on real customer requirements is, uh, is, is essential so that when you get to the point that you need to prove product market fit, you understand what is the product, you understand what is the product and you understand what is, what is the market need that you're responding to. Even if that particular use case may not be worth billions of dollars, but you already know some sort of a step progression towards the bigger market. Um, so when we look at companies, we, we look at that gap between the idea that's in the founder's head and the actual market and how you de-risk that gap gradually as you go from pre-seed to A round. It's not always that simple. It's not always it doesn't always require for you to jump and develop the actual product as a first step. It might take some patience to fully understand the market. It's, I think, less trivial than it sounds when, when I say it right now. I can give examples, but it will just take too long. So when we meet, if you want to learn more, I can tell you about a couple of really important examples that taught me some serious lessons in this aspect. Yes, <clears throat> I agree. I think um, it's extremely difficult, even when you think that you have product market fit, to really assess whether this product market fit uh, is real or whether it's just you know based on a large POCs kind of thing or uh, on promises, empty promises often. Um, you know, I've invested in a couple of companies where I spoke to 
um, strategic players which have you know, invested in some cases in the company or in one case it's a major strategy their number one strategic player in, in that company's uh, uh, market and they want they we, you know before investing we had a call with them a year and a half ago and they told us yeah for sure I mean the, it, it, it's amazing and of course it's a great solution and we are going to actually sell this solution to all our clients and it's part of the of the solution that we are going to propose to everybody and we spoke with a extremely high up person there and he, he was enthusiastic not only was he enthusiastic he actually went publicly and he said that not to us to the market where one and a half years later we're still waiting so you know when you go in later stages um, <clears throat> it's easier in that respect of course valuation is in is of course different but when we invest um, at our stages I mean you are earlier than us we are at series A so a little bit later but still the truth is even at series A there's a to a certain extent there's a leap of faith um, it's unfortunate to have to say that but that's my own personal uh, experience because you really can't trust anybody uh, the only thing you can really trust is revenues and growing, 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 growing revenues at significant levels. But at that point, we're already not in Series A, right? Generally. So while we're here, can I just ask you what you look for and how you define what a true product market fit is? <laughs> That's an excellent question. <laughs> Those companies sound like we're looking for you. <laughs> um, now, first of all, I think you, you want to have some sort of, you know, a serious design partner. You want to see that, you know, there's a number of serious POCs as much as is possible, as I just, because of what I said just before, as much as is really possible to assess. Um, you want to see that there's really early sales traction. You try to speak to existing clients, to potential clients. You try to assess the needs, and you try to see if the need is being answered by by the solution. And as you said, whether the market is big enough, that's a given. Um, but, you know, again, at our stages, that's, uh, maybe I'm missing something or I don't think about something here, but there's not very much more than, 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 you, than that that you can do. You just have to, you know, and try and see and hope. <laughs> it's very, very difficult. It's, uh, the truth is it's much more difficult than I expected. And I can tell you there's a company where we invested five and a half years ago. It's a hardware company. And it's in a... I think personally it's going to become the largest Israeli company. Um, it's an amazing, amazing company. Really amazing and it's advancing. But it's hard and long and difficult. And, uh, and uh, the use case which we had in our mind five years ago, is, it may happen, but maybe in ten years from now. It probably will happen, but a long, long time from now. And Actually, the company now is starting to to, 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 to actually penetrate and do actually have real sales, but it's something that nobody, even they didn't think about it at the time. Even two years ago, they didn't think about it. It's a new stuff, but it's working. So if you ask me you know, about product market fit, did I think that if anybody in the company, including the CEO and the CTO and whatever, even think about having a product market fit in that specific vertical, Two years ago, the answer is no. Even a year ago, it sound, sounded interesting. But, and now it's, it's looking, it's, it's actually going to work. So that's what I said, you need uh, it, this you know, leap of faith. That's how I say it. Yeah, um, I think people realize, right, I, I hope so, the audience here, right? Uh, robotics company take many more years to be ready than a consumer app or enterprise SaaS or security software. Okay, you need to take many more years. That's number one. Okay, so as a founder, you have to explain your vision. Okay, you have to show your technology roadmap because you are not going to have your product even in the first year or second year. You are lucky to have a product in the second year. Okay, that's why. 
you know, what I mentioned earlier, right? I pay more attention to technology innovation and the market size. Because I know you don't have a product. Usually only four things you will look into as investor. Team, product, technology, and market. That's the four things we look into, right? General. But because of robotics, I know I, I cannot really find a product yet when we look into early stage. Even you, you say, yes, you have a product, and my natural reaction is, you're probably going after a very small market. So it's not interesting. You are not ambitious enough. Okay. So it's very important as founder, number one, don't tell me you are doing science, okay? <laughs> because that should be done at the labs, at, at the university. So science, too early. Technology, about right, but product, it's gonna take more years. So as a founder, you need to really convey your technology roadmap, okay? More specifically say, explain how much you understand that problem, how difficult it is. You can explain the problems better than anyone else. Then I have a chance to believe in you as a team. And then you say, oh, oh, the problem is so hard, but I know if my approach works. See, I don't ask for implementation. My, uh, my approach works. Here's my roadmap. Then, then I'll assess what kind of capital we require for you to achieve the milestones. So you manage basically the investor's expectation. Okay? The worst mistake you're gonna get is you get some investor in, but they have a total different expectation than you have. Very likely you're gonna lose that argument because at the next round they're gonna blame you as a liar. You don't want to get yourself in there because you're already married. Okay? So that's the thing is for us, we pay more attention to technology. Don't have too much. Okay? This is robotics, it's not a software. Okay, your product will take years to mature. Okay. So the same problem as being the last to speak. Most was covered, but I do think the way we look at most of what was said here is commercial markers. So those of you who come from healthcare, there is this thing called biomarkers, which is indicative of the presence of certain diseases. I think you can take the same and take that to commercial traction. It's sometimes understanding the real cash flow, the real way money flows in the industry you're trying to penetrate into and understand who are the right stakeholders that you'll need to be in touch with and sell to when your technology matures. I want to see that you have that understanding relatively early on. I want to see that you're engaging, engaging with them and building your technology and product in a way that will fit their needs. Because at the end of the day, the customer is the one that sets the tone. And even if they're sometimes slower and sometimes not mature enough to really adopt it today, they'll need to adopt it two, three, five years from now. And I want to see, we want to see that the founding team, that the technology is all being developed around that vision. And we assume that it's going to change and that the product design itself is going to change by the time it gets to general availability. But to be able to prove those initial signs of commercial understanding, commercial traction, again, it comes down to unit economics, the business model itself. Um, we're going to ask the same questions when we look at a classic SaaS company. You just have that additional hurdle that you need to clear, which is understanding how you fit this hardware piece into that. And as everyone said here, understanding the deep technology, understanding the way you build it, building the right approach to tackle these questions is crucial. And adding that commercial aspect, that initial commercial traction, or signs of understanding the commercial aspect of things, for us it's critical when we look at these types of investments. Thanks, guys. Um, maybe if quickly, Amir, um, I want to make sure we're all on the same page because I think we live in VC jargon. Um, and to make sure that everybody understands kind of the, the core venture capital model. So a few things that have been highlighted, um, that hardware is challenging, unit economics, uh, that you might not see your first customer for a few years and why that's, a, why that's a, a challenge or a limitation to the venture capital model. So if one of you two want to just give a brief overview on the VC model. You regret sitting on that side now. So where do I start? LPGP? Uh, 10 years? Just 
that. We speak math in this audience, so I figured 10 years was an important one to highlight. Fun size, why it matters, how that creates limitations, how it creates limitations for us. Um, why do we need to bother them with our problems? They... So they understand our decision making. <laughs> Yeah, so a typical fund is a 10-year program, which means that even if you're the first investment in, you have to show signs of somehow um, initial signs of being able to exit within seven years, eight years. So the journey that uh, for hardware companies is longer than in software sometimes poses a challenge for, for funds. And it's not always the case because uh, not everything takes 20 years like iRobot. Um, which, by the way, a lot of people consider a huge success. But at the end of the day, they had to grow their revenue uh, to over a billion dollars just to be sold for 1x revenue which you know, was after going public and raising more than $100 million from you know, private investors in the, in the public market. Um, so at the end of the day, it's not really the huge success story that uh, a lot of people think, think it is, just because it took so long. And if you, if you were a fund that invested in the seed round, you had to wait 20, 20 some years to to get your money back, unless you did a secondary site somewhere along the way. Uh, so these long-term projects really test the boundaries of, of at least from a time perspective, uh, of, uh, of venture capital funds. And when you think about the time that it takes, you also need to think about the valuation curve. So how much can you increase the value of a company within a year, 18 months, two years, so that the next round is de-risked in such a way that the, the, the valuation will be much higher so that you know we can show our investors that you guys are making huge progress so that they'll be happy with us and fund us for the next fund. Uh, so I don't know, maybe there are a few other aspects uh, but I believe also some uh, for my colleagues here to, uh, to add. You guys know what's what's a company? What what's what is a company? What's the goal of a company? Yes, make make money. There's no other way, uh, uh, reason for a company exists. Nothing. Absolutely nothing. The only reason why their companies exist is to make profit. Everything that we do is a means to the end. The end is profitability. Nothing else. Why do I say that? Because enterprise software, you can see that very fast. Robotics has to, again, remember what I said at the beginning? You are, we are competing for the same, at the end of the day, same pool of money against all the other guys, right? So we have to reach the same level of returns but it's going to take longer. And because it's going to take longer and the risk is going to be higher because there's more friction, it's hardware and all this thing, I don't want to have the same sort of revenues as I get in enterprise software. In other words, what's the point? I'm going to invest in enterprise software, right? So I want to actually make more money. That's complicated, huh? that's a hard proposition. But the truth is, if I'm not going to be able to de-risk my investment either by having, I would say, a lower attrition rate, in other words, having uh, fewer failures, more successes, so maybe not more return per company, but fewer losses and therefore altogether better returns, or that the companies themselves do better, then why, why am I, you know, as he said, you know, 10 years, 20 years, when you can go to a, a SaaS company where you 
typically it's going to take just a few years. So that's, that's, that's the challenge. Of course, on the other hand, SaaS companies can do like that, but very fast they can do also like that, right? Whereas because robotics is hardware, because it's more complicated, if you create a good solution, one hopes, it may not be, it may not be true, but one hopes that solution will be more sustainable. It's going to stay in the market longer, right? So pluses, minuses, but uh, yeah, that's how I look at it. I, um, this is all totally right, uh, but I'll, I'll give additional hope, maybe some hope for you guys, right? Um, if you go off the financial VC, totally, you cannot compete against, you know, uh, SaaS, the, their cycle is much faster, right? Um, and, the, and the VC, well, human being, we don't want to you know, spend years of our time to manage one portfolio company, which because time is also, uh, uh, you know, at the end of the day, constraining resource. But the, the, the hope is that VC funds, they take money from other investors, they call the LPs, limited partners. Many VCs take money from industrial machine builders, logistic companies, agriculture companies. So they, they also, those LPs have a special interest. And in many cases, they're gonna select the funds who are also driving towards those investment areas. So those are the funds you maybe have a chance as a robotics company to get investment from. So you need to do the homework, okay, to look for those funds. Because then they are setting up, their LPs are encouraging them to go after those market. And and the, their sort of a return expectation may be lower because for in, return, in exchange for strategic value. And the, the other pool of money is companies like us, we are corporate VCs. We do things mostly for strategic reasons in addition for financial return. Our financial consideration is very simple, just want the companies to be alive. You got to stay alive to collaborate with something. As simple as that. Okay. So those are the things you guys need to pay attention. The last thing I want to repeat myself, right? You need to think about right on some of the you know the hard trends. The hardest trend today is generative AI. Right, who's driving that? You probably remember Open AI, right, as a company. But do you know in the first a few years, OpenAI considered themselves as a robotics company? Because they think they want to craft artificial general intelligence. The best embodiment of that is in a robot. Yeah? So be more ambitious. And you run some hard trend. Maybe the financial visas were going after you. It's hard to compete with this visionary thing, but I do think that we're gonna see more financial VCs playing in the robotics field. I think today with generative AI, we're starting to see a bit of a commoditization of software. Um, we're seeing development barriers going down. We're seeing what used to be companies becoming features now in the software side. And I think that some of the financial investors are already sensing that and are starting to look more into the hardware and robotics space. And I think a hurdle that still exists for these investors are the unknown unknowns. When most investors look at the software companies, they know the struggles, they know the pains, they know the barriers these companies are gonna face. When they're looking at hardware and robotics companies, they have no clue. And it's a hard decision to do. It's a hard uh, hurdle to pass as an investor, to walk into something you don't really understand what you're gonna be facing, the struggles, the pains, the pitfalls. So when you look at investors, try to see who are you invested in hardware. Try to gauge the questions you ask them. Do they understand these issues? Do they understand these gaps that I'm gonna face? I might not, not have the answer of how I'm gonna pass face these challenges, but I know they'll come. And these investors are the ones that are more likely to 
go forward in an investment because they already understand the challenges. Sometimes they even have experience in facing those challenges, have basically earned their stripes and, um, and probably failed with some other previous companies doing that uh, thing. But these investors are the ones that are more likely to take the jump and go into a robotics company. Thank you guys all for entertaining that question. Um, I think we are coming up on time, and so if we could give a nice, um, if each investor could give a nice like TLDR, just tuning in to the panel, what's one thing that you want everybody here to walk away with? We can start with you, Roy. Go for a grand vision. Building, I think it was said many multiple times during this panel, uh, don't build a feature, don't build something for a small town, build a platform, build something that really addresses a big pain and go big. Going small never works, not for a company, not for a VC. Um, try to apply generative AI. Yeah, dream big. And if you drink big enough, you're going to bring along with you people who are going to adhere to your vision. It's possible. Go and read the article about superhuman struggle to find product market fit. Raul Vura, the founder, wrote a wonderful article about what product market fit is. At the end of the day, you want to build a product that if you give it to a customer and you ask him, what would happen if I take the product away? He would say, I would die. Or something close to that. Uh, in software, it's a little bit easier to do it statistically. You give the product to a thousand people, and you know, if 400 or more say that they would be super disappointed if you took the product away, then you have product market fit. Go read the article, it's more sophisticated than that. But at the end of the day, you want to build a product that if you give it to someone, they'll never give it back to you. If you're cleaning decks, or cleaning solar panels, or if you're, whatever you're doing, you give it to a customer to try it out, and they're not gonna give you the product back. That's your, at the end of the day, that's your goal from pre-seed to A, no, by A, you have to be there. Or a may be A plus, you have to be there. One customer or three customers to tell you, you're not getting your uh, beta back ever. That's a good ending. Amazing. Thank you for the excellent <laughs> ending. Thank you, everybody, for your attention. And thank you for the panelists. Thank you, Lizzie. I think you should do the next one.